On this Monday night, historic bomb cyclone. Extreme weather hits the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. and Canada. Okay, that's an eerie sound. The tens of thousands left powerless and the destruction. Containing the fire on a container ship off B.C., the fears for the environment and the supply chain crisis. What's behind all the disruptions? Facebook further exposed. The algorithms take people who have very mainstream interests and they push them towards extreme interests. The new treasure trove of internal documents leaked. And a Spanish volcano's widening threat, the uncertainty for the people of La Palma. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with a bout of extreme weather buffeting the Pacific Northwest from San Francisco north to the BC coast. What's known as a bomb cyclone, a rare phenomenon that rapidly intensifies. And this is one for the record books. In Northern California, it unleashed heavy rain and strong winds, water replacing fires and drought, and triggering flash floods and landslides in places where vegetation had been burned away. An atmospheric river converged with the cyclone, toppling trees and knocking over scaffolding in the San Francisco area. Power was knocked out to tens of thousands of people. Just crossing a bridge became a perilous journey. This semi was nearly blown right off. And that howling sound is from the Golden Gate Bridge. Gale force winds caused an eerie whistle that could be heard for miles. Near Seattle, the storm turned deadly. Two people were killed when a tree fell onto their vehicle. In British Columbia, it is the strongest low pressure system ever recorded. Wind warnings remain in place for Metro Vancouver and Vancouver Island, but it hasn't been as destructive as south of the border. Still, ferries have been cancelled and crews are dealing with power outages and downed trees. And the Coast Guard says the weather has made it impossible for a salvage crew to board the container ship that caught fire near Victoria. Some containers continue to smolder. About 40 others ended up in the water and are drifting in the sea, some of them carrying hazardous chemicals. Robin Gill has our top story tonight. Anchored near Victoria, B.C., the MV Zim Kingston is taking a beating from strong winds hitting Vancouver Island. This is not the kind of weather the five remaining crew members need when trying to contain hot spots below deck. Smoke is still present. Salvage Master has stated there are still pockets of flame and some ISO containers have internal fires. The weather is preventing firefighters from getting on the ship to help. It's not clear how the fire started, but it is confined to 10 containers. Two tugboats that happened to be there have helped in the fight. It was very fortunate uh, that these two large escort tugs were here and were able to respond uh, as quickly as they did. The concern is the containers carrying over 52,000 kilograms of potassium amyl xanthate, a hazardous material used in mining. This it continues to be a very dangerous and difficult situation. The fire was the second spell of trouble for this beleaguered boat. Sailing under the flag of Malta, the 260-meter ship left South Korea for Vancouver. Last Thursday, it got caught in a storm. The waves were so rocky, the ship couldn't stay upright, and 40 containers slipped off. In the big picture, it's a very small impact on the supply chain. Yes, is there a lot of cargo on board a ship that size? Of course. Um, will that have impacts for people that are waiting for that cargo? Yes, and it's going to be a, a lengthy delay. Nine ships enter the port of Vancouver on a daily basis. More than three million containers are processed every year, and imports to this part of Canada are up 18 percent over last year. All that marine activity has environmentalists worried. The damage is often underreported and um, and it's it's uh, undersold to the public, but it's it's long term damage. Both the American and Canadian Coast Guards are monitoring the environmental impact, and there are still those missing containers to recover. Robin Gill, Global News, Vancouver. Container ships are key to keeping the world's supply chain functioning, and for months now, that chain has been holding together by a thread. There are backlogs of container ships waiting at key ports, and from rail yards to warehouses, there is gridlock. Tonight, we begin a new Global News series called Short Supply. And Gaviola explains what's behind the delays, shortages, and higher costs. 
Phil Swanson lays fiber cables for home internet in rural Alberta. Demand is still surging due to the pandemic with people working and studying from home. But lengthy delays in importing product mean he's racing against the clock to install before the ground freezes. We're playing a lot of catch up this year because we did lose four months of build season. So we're hoping the snow doesn't fly here relatively shortly and shut us down. Supply chain snarls have impacted all kinds of things, from cables to cars, appliances to Halloween costumes. There's a shortage of microchips, key components in laptops, cell phones, cars. And you may have noticed some items, especially those which need to be shipped from Asia and Europe, are in short supply or missing in action. What we're seeing is the result of a chain reaction caused by COVID. Factories have resumed operations to meet demand as economies around the world roar back. Increased COVID protocols mean shipping takes longer because of new safety measures at ports. Plus, products that weren't in high demand before, like masks and other PPE, are now taking up room in shipping containers. The Drury World Container Index, a global benchmark, shows shipping costs have soared nearly 300 percent in the past year. And there's another important piece in this puzzle, too, labor shortages, which make it hard to staff factories and ports. We've really seen a sustained uh, increase that doesn't show any signs of slowing down. We haven't even gotten into shipping containers. They're in short supply, too. I've got people on conference calls saying that there were times they were paying $2,500 or you know, $5,000 for a container, and now it's upwards of $25,000. Even though some ports in California are working around the clock, it is chaos. The Biden administration is reportedly considering enlisting the National Guard to reduce the backlog. Now, once items arrive on shore, they need to be trucked to merchandising centers. But you guessed it, there's a shortage of truck drivers, too. Analysts say there is an end in sight, but not until halfway through 2022, when things are likely to get worse ahead of the holiday season. Expect delays, shortages, and higher prices. Donna? All right, Anne Gaviola in Toronto, thanks. It is the eve of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau swearing in his new cabinet, the team he's chosen to run the country. We know there will be some new faces because some past ministers either didn't run or lost their seats in the September election. And we know Christian Freeland is staying on as Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister. Apart from that, there's lots of speculation. Abigail Beeman is watching this for us. Abigail, what's the balance the Prime Minister is likely going to try to strike? Donna, there are a few elements at play. First, the Prime Minister has committed to gender parity, and he has his work cut out for him since he lost four ministers, all of them women. Catherine McKenna, who did not run again, and two Ontario ministers, and one in Nova Scotia who lost their seats. Speaking of regions, Trudeau is also going to try and balance geographical representation in the new cabinet. Someone to replace the Atlantic seat for one, Sean Fraser, and former Nova Scotia Justice Minister Lena Metledge-Diab, a rookie MP, are some of the names being floated there. And after being shut out of Alberta in 2019, the Liberals managed to elect two MPs there. Important to have some Western representation in cabinet. At least one is likely to be added between George Shahal and Randy Boissonneau, a former special advisor to the Prime Minister. Those two are both men, which is where the speculation about a bigger cabinet comes into play. Currently, there are 36 ministers plus the Prime Minister. If Trudeau adds a man from Alberta, he'll need to either get rid of a sitting male minister or grow the ranks to make it even. As for the women, a wide range of speculation, depending who you ask. There's a long list of potential female MPs who could be eyed for a seat at the inner circle's table. And Abigail, what's the thinking on which ministers who were seen to be top performers might be back and who might be shuffled out of cabinet? Well, uh, lots of people have eyes on the defense file for one. Minister Harjit Sajjan has come under fire for his handling of the number of misconduct issues that have rocked the military. The Conservatives today piled on, putting out a statement calling for him to be fired. There's a lot of talk about getting a woman into that job. Anita Anand seems to be the top possibility. She is seen by the inner circle as a real star in cabinet for her handling of vaccines as procurement minister, so in line for a promotion. A lot of people also watching the health Health file, hugely important, of course, in the pandemic. Does Patty Haidu keep the job? It's a balancing act as to whether to shuffle her out without making it seem like the Liberals are admitting some sort of failure in their pandemic response. We have seen other ministers active in recent days beyond just Deputy Prime Minister Krista Freeland, who we know keeps her job. We'll see if there are shuffles at immigration or environment with the COP26 climate summit looming. Ministers Marco Mendicino and Environment Minister Jonathan Wilkinson have been in the spotlight, too. Donna?
All right. All will be revealed tomorrow. Abigail Beeman in Ottawa. Thanks. Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe is still resisting putting in any more public health restrictions. He's faced harsh criticism over his handling of the fourth wave of COVID-19. For weeks, Saskatchewan has had the highest case and death rates of all the provinces. Moe says he's optimistic the situation is moving now in the right direction. Uh, about 70 nurses that are coming out of uh, out of uh, training uh, that will be available in our ICU departments. We've uh, requested uh, help from the federal government. They've provided about six uh, critical care nurses. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, to your question, numbers are decreasing. Uh, they've been decreasing since, uh, you know, for about four weeks now. Our numbers are down. Our seven-day rolling average is down about 45%. Um, that is a positive, and that's an indication that the measures that we introduced are working. Mo says most people are now fully vaccinated and he says it doesn't make sense to restrict everyone's activities and personal freedoms. Ontario and BC are lifting capacity limits for those who are fully vaccinated. In Ontario, gyms, casinos and restaurants can now operate at full capacity. Museums, art galleries, places of worship and salons can too if they ask for proof of vaccination. And in BC, fully vaccinated residents can now enjoy hockey games, concerts and weddings at full capacity. There's still a 50% cap on capacity in regions where vaccination rates are lower. The vaccination rate among members of the Canadian military is over 90%, but the military has other problems. It has long struggled to boost the number of women in its ranks, and that's especially true now. As Ross Lord reports, allegations of sexual misconduct against senior members of the military could be having a major impact. Ever since Canada's high-profile mission in Afghanistan created a surge in job applications, more people have been leaving the forces than signing up. A 2016 Auditor General's report showed numbers shrank from almost 68,000 in 2012 to 66,400 by 2016, and the decline continues. The Forces Recruiting Centre in Borden, Ontario, says as of September 30th, there are fewer than 65,000 regular force members. With an attrition rate of between 7 to 8 percent a year, replacing those who leave the forces with new recruits has been a losing battle. The military blames the pandemic, which made it tougher to process applications. Not as much training was happening, so not as many positions that we could enroll people into because of the same complications. But even ready-made professionals are avoiding the forces. When the pandemic brought commercial airlines to a virtual standstill, it opened the door for pilots to defect to the Air Force. This defense analyst says fewer than a handful made the jump. The lesson for me is if you couldn't get them, if you couldn't get them back in big numbers in this circumstance, then you are just utterly uh, in the hurt locker. A high priority recruiting target is also slipping away, increasing the percentage of women in the regular and reserve force from 16 percent to 25 percent by the year 2026. A goal some suggest has gone from ambitious to impossible. I'd be very surprised if uh, the current sexual misconduct crisis didn't have a chilling effect on recruitment, especially with women. In fact, two of the force's higher-ups forced to step aside, Lieutenant General Stephen Whalen and Vice Admiral Hayden Edmondson, were in charge of recruiting. This is a challenging time period to, uh, for the Canadian Armed Forces. Like other employers, recruiting sessions have been moved online. Train for your true calling with the Canadian Armed Forces. Marketing messages have not changed. All of these factors uh, do not help uh, the current strain in terms of military personnel and the personnel shortages. And it's one of many stressors on the organization in this moment. A new ad campaign aimed at women was to have begun this month. It's been delayed. So has a new strategy for persuading members to stay. As the military struggles to build for the future while reckoning with the past. Ross Lohr, Global News, Halifax. Coming up, the military seizes power in Sudan, arresting the prime minister and dissolving civilian rule. In Sudan, the military has seized control in an apparent coup, detaining the prime minister and dissolving the country's transitional government.
Protesters marched in the streets of the capital Khartoum and blocked off roads. Doctors say at least three people were killed and at least 80 others wounded after security forces opened fire on the crowds. Tensions had been building ahead of a planned handover to civilian rule. The government has been led by a transitional council made up of the military and civilian parties since the country's longtime autocratic ruler Omar al-Bashir was overthrown two years ago. The military has imposed a state of emergency. Its leader claims the transition will continue and elections will be held in 2023, but international leaders are condemning the coup. In a statement, Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister Mark Garneau said, We stand with the Sudanese people in their desire for a democratic future. And a new report from the United Nations warns Afghanistan is on the edge of a humanitarian catastrophe. The World Food Program says about half the country's population is facing food insecurity. Without urgent action, millions of people could die of starvation. Afghanistan was already facing a food crisis before the Taliban took over. The situation was made even worse when countries froze foreign aid payments. According to the UN report, about $273 million Canadian in aid will be needed each month to stave off disaster. The Facebook papers ahead damning documents shed light on the social media giant's threat to democracy. We're getting the clearest picture yet of how Facebook endangers democracy. Thousands of leaked documents are being called the Facebook Papers, and they suggest the company knows its platform is being used to spread misinformation, harm democracy, and promote online radicalization. As Jackson Prosco reports, Facebook insists it's not putting profits ahead of safety, but the evidence suggests otherwise. Facebook was built on likes and shares, and that may be its fundamental problem. They don't want to do anything that's going to drive people away from continually scrolling, engaging with posts and clicking and watching ads. Thousands of documents released by a former employee turned whistleblower suggest Facebook is acutely aware of how its platform spreads misinformation, incites violence and radicalizes people around the world. The algorithms take people who have very mainstream interests and they push them towards extreme interests. Mark Zuckerberg has previously called such claims illogical. But leaked documents show the company knew of the rampant spread of vaccine hesitancy in user comments. The company's internal research found that conspiracy theories like QAnon could be automatically served up to a user within two days of that user liking certain content. And more internal research found a lack of local staff who could monitor content in developing countries like Afghanistan, where most hate speech made it past automatic filters. I would say that they're very well aware of the way that their platform can indoctrinate and radicalize people because this was a study done by their own researchers that has been replicated by people like me. Yet the documents also suggest the company faces an internal battle over what to do about it. I became convinced that Facebook was causing harm in the world and causing division in the world. Brian Boland worked on partnerships and product strategy at Facebook. He says he tried to make change from within, but ultimately resigned. I'm concerned that Facebook causes divisions in a lot of areas, political being one of them, and a powerful one that we feel viscerally, but also in race and ethnicity, religion. The central complaint remains that the company prioritizes profits over safety. In a statement to Global News, a spokesperson refuted that. The truth is we've invested $13 billion and have over 40,000 people to do one job, keep people safe on Facebook. Yet the documents only add to the growing pressure on the company to make serious reforms or face stricter regulation, as government and Facebook's own users become increasingly aware of the platform's impact. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. The takeover of the island of La Palma next. Will the rivers of lava ever end? The volcano on the Spanish island of La Palma has been erupting for over a month. The slow-moving rivers of lava relentlessly devouring everything in their path. Thousands of people have already been displaced. More than 2,100 buildings have been damaged or destroyed. And as Eric Sorensen reports, the volcano is far from finished. Even from space, it is a spectacular sight to behold. A window into the depths of the planet that can reshape the landscape overnight. Up close, it is menacing and unpredictable. 
The Cumbre Vieja volcano on La Palma is enormous. Since last month, the lava has covered nearly 900 hectares and destroyed more than 2,000 buildings. Most of the 83,000 residents are still in their homes, but the entire population is nervous. Every hour, every day, he says, we are thinking about this volcano. How many weeks, she says, will Christmas come like this? It is very difficult to deal with. The volcano has been spewing lava for five weeks and now has become more active. A secondary cone collapsed Monday, creating a new channel of lava. For all that scientists have learned about volcanoes, they have made little headway in predicting how long eruptions will last. There is nothing to tell us that it could end, says this local volcanologist. There's no data to indicate that volcanic activity is decreasing. We will have to see if it lasts weeks or months. Volcanoes are among the most violent features on Earth and a source of fascination through history. It's at a different scale from what humans are normally used to dealing with, um, but it does give us uh, insights into to what's happening underground. Sometimes volcanoes bring up samples from 100 or 150 kilometers down beneath our feet. For me, scientifically, that's why it is so exciting. La Palma is popular with tourists, the volcano a favorite attraction. But now the streets are empty, tourists gone, and some banana plantations, a mainstay of the economy, are being destroyed. Many, many thousands and thousands of people, they have lost everything, house, animals. There will be much to learn and to see here in the future. But it is when a volcano is at its most visually breathtaking, it's also the most dangerous. And the goal for now is survival. Eric Sorensen, Global News. And that is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight here in Canada is a shed near Sudbury, Ontario. Hey, bud. You never know who's going to show up on a Saturday night. This moose invited himself over, got a tap on the nose as a welcome, but when he tried to get to the beer fridge, they politely asked him to leave. No way, eh? Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.